To go along with the author's note, um, there are also some interviews in the back of the book from people who actually lived on Alcatraz, which I think are really interesting, along with some photos. So this first one is Daughter of Al Capone's Doctor. Phyllis Sweetie Hess Twainy lived on Alcatraz Island because her father was the chief medical officer from 1934 to 1939. So the author interviewed her via email on March 3rd, 2013. There's a picture there of the kindergarten children. Question one, when did you live on the island? From 1934 through 1939. Like Moose and Al Capone does my homework, I lived on Officer's Row. Our Alcatraz home was built in the late 1800s. It had Victorian architecture and dust and mold from the same era. I loved living there. The bells, whistles, and foghorns were just part of comforting normal life. What was your father's job? My father, Dr. George Hess, was the chief medical officer on the island. We arrived on the island to help supervise the retrofitting of the prison hospital and stayed through the first few years of operation. Did you have any contact with the prisoners? Alcatraz was just like any street in any town in America. The only difference was we had high security convicts. Did I see them? Yes. Did I have contact with them? No. Did you ever meet a pass man? If by pass men you mean the convict servants in the warden's house, no, I never met them. My father was not in favor of Warden Johnston having prisoners in white jackets doing servant duty in his house. Dad hired a housekeeper for us. She was Irish, her name was Lydia, and she came over on the first boat each morning. She taught me the right way to eat oatmeal. She had lots of right ways to do things. What did your father think of Al Capone? Al Capone was my father's specially assigned patient. They met in Atlanta where Capone was held before Alcatraz. My father was aware Al was a highly demanding and very sick man. That only made my father more sensitive to Al's plight. What did Capone think of your father? Al liked the bedside manner of my father and his assistant, Nurse Ping. He threw hissy fits with the other medical staff. With Al's medical condition, he was choosy as to who he would let touch him, which meant my father got stuck with him from Atlanta to Alcatraz to Terminal Island. It all boiled down to let Dr. Hess handle him. Did you ever receive a gift from Al Capone? Al Capone sent an occasional present via my father. Once he wrote a piece of music for me. He had heard I was born in Ohio, so he wrote a song called Beautiful, Beautiful Ohio and signed it for Dr. Hess, little daughter from Al Capone. What else can you tell us about Capone? The best story about Capone is that dad and nurse Charles Ping and a guard took Al by train back to his family in Florida. This trip was supposed to be top secret. Walter Winchell, the radio gossip columnist, broadcast the exact train, route, and layover. No one to this day knows who leaked this information to Winchell. Since my dad did not have a radio, he was shocked to see the press out in full force when the train pulled into St. Louis. Don't laugh, but it was Al who was the dodgiest of them all. He suggested that he and my father be handcuffed while Charlie and the guard put their guns dismantled under the seats, blast out onto the platform and bash cameras and create a distraction. Dad and Al hightailed it off the other side and ran, shackled together to the next train for Al to get home. What was the scariest place on the island? There were no scary places for me on Alcatraz. The only person who scared the liver out of me was the warden. What do you miss most about Alcatraz? I miss Alcatraz because there was a, such enormous goodwill among the families on the island. We understood our rules. They made sense. It's the only place I've ever lived where I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. Life has been a la carte ever since. Raised on the Rock. Chuck Stucker grew up on Alcatraz Island because his father was a guard in the prison. He lived on the island from 1940 to 1943 and from 1948 to 1953. He is a well-respected Alcatraz historian and archivist. Did your parents ever worry about you living on the island? They never voiced any concern. We didn't lock our doors. Not everybody opted to live on Alcatraz. Some felt the community on Alcatraz was too small. Everybody knew everybody's business. What was the scariest part of living on Alcatraz? My only fear was being caught in a place I shouldn't have been. We heard that our fathers could be fired if we got in trouble. What was your favorite Alcatraz prank? There were two of them. The first happened on the 4th of July. Bill Hart and I bought fireworks in Chinatown. This was back when the fireworks were really large, nothing like they have today. We put one on the parade ground with a really long fuse. We lit the fuse, then skedaddled back to our apartments. I was lying in bed when it went off. 
They investigated but didn't find out who did it. Someone asked my father and he said, couldn't have been Chuck, he was asleep in his bed. The second one is a bit like you have an Al Capone shines my shoes. We were climbing down the floors, we were climbing between the floors of 64 building. Bill told me don't step off the two by four supports. My foot slipped. It didn't go through the ceiling, but people noticed. They yelled earthquake. When we got back, everyone asked us if we'd felt the earthquake. The crack is still there. Did you ever break an Alcatraz rule? I broke all sign rules. Anything that said do not enter, any fence or sign was subject to violation. Did you need to treat your father differently than you might have ordinarily? I was told never to jump out and say boo. We couldn't surprise them because they were always on alert. Did convicts ever seem like they knew you? We used to help the convicts load the laundry and the trash on the truck. They just seemed like adults to us. My sister was older and she remembers the cons that had made talent that had trade talents, plumbers and electricians coming into our home to help us out. Once a convict asked her if we were the Stuckers from Leavenworth, that upset her. Did you ever meet a pass man? a convict who works in the warden's home. Yes, I met Montgomery, who was a pass man for Warden Swope. I used to fish with Warden Swope's wife. I would knock on the warden's door and Montgomery would answer. Were you ever on the island during an escape attempt? Yes, but I was a baby at the time. I do remember hearing rebellious behavior in the cell block. The prison population would rattle cups on the bars, yell and scream. My sister remembers hearing the escape siren going off. The protocol was to lock yourself in your apartment and wait. The fear was that a convict would grab a hostage. What do you miss most? The social group and the fishing. There was no limit to the amount of fish you could catch. No game warden. You didn't need a license. I caught capazzoni, eel, perch, stingray, sand, and leopard sharks up to four and five feet long. Any do-overs? What do you wish you'd done now that you didn't do then? Every kid wanted to go into the cell block. You had to be 21 years, 21 years old to get in there. When I turned 21, I came back to Alcatraz because the warden's daughter married my cousin. I was able to get a tour. I was in a boat with a group of about 25 other people. When I got off the boat, a convict who was working on the dock came up to me and grabbed my arm. He said, are you Ed Stucker's son? Tell your father hello. I always liked the man. This was eight years after my father left Alcatraz. I wish I had asked that convict his name or his Alcatraz number, but I was so surprised I didn't. I don't know how he picked me out of a group of 25. The prisoners knew who everyone was. Can you describe your first look inside the cell house? It was intimidating. It felt like I was in a zoo. I did not want to stare. There are a million myths about Alcatraz. How would you like to set the record straight? The Alcatraz myths were created by the secrecy and Hollywood. In the 30s, media was not allowed on the island. The inmates who were released gave interviews, which only added to the mystery and the mystique. The press was never allowed to come and take a look. To me, the real events are more interesting than fiction. Why do you think you're so fascinated by the island? I guess I started collecting information about Alcatraz because I saw the history was being lost. I wanted to make peop sure people's stories were recorded. I wanted to be a keeper of information. What is the strangest true story you know about Alcatraz? Prisoners on Alcatraz knew everything there was to know. Cons knew about Pearl Harbor before the guards did. They had their own sources of information. Toughest convict on the rock. Robert Luke, Alcatraz convict number 1118, was on the island from 1954 to 1959. Alcatraz was his sixth prison. No trouble with the law since Alcatraz. While on Alcatraz, did you dream of being free? All the time. Were you afraid during your years on Alcatraz? Never. I had a reputation for being extremely violent. People were careful around me. The only time I was afraid on Alcatraz was when I came back a few years ago when the ranger asked me to speak to the public. What did you do to pass the time on Alcatraz? I read two or three books a week, checked out from the cell house library. I like history. I must have read the decline and fall of the Roman Empire three or four times. When I read a book, I actually become a part of it. My imagination helped too. Sometimes I would take a trip up in my head. Did you ever play baseball in the rec yard on Alcatraz? Yes, I was a fielder. There was only one fielder as we had six-man teams. There was no room in the recreation yard for more. What happened when the ball went over the wall? If it went over the right field wall, it was an automatic out. 
If it went over the center field, it, field wall, it was a home run. If it went on the roof of the cell house, it was good for two bases. You have said your cell was the size of a pool table. Did it ever feel like home? No, we called it our house, but not a home. I've heard you say that you didn't seriously consider an escape from Alcatraz because as a U.S. Navy man, you understood how difficult it would be to swim to freedom given the currents in the bay and the temperature of the water. If you were to plan an escape from Alcatraz, how would you do it? The only chance would be if you worked outside. I was never allowed to work outside, be outside because I was an escape risk. The last warden was lax. He didn't check the cells. That's one of the reasons the 1962 escape happened. What question do you get asked the most? Did you know Al Capone? Capone died before your time in Alcatraz, of course. Yes, but if I had been in prison with him, I would have kept my distance. I stayed away from connected criminals because they often have influence over the police or the guards. But you knew Machine Gun Kelly, right? Yes, he played bridge on the recreation yard. Did you have visits on Alcatraz? Only one. I didn't like visits because they reminded me too much of what it was like outside. What was your worst day on Alcatraz? My worst days were the 29 days I spent in the disciplinary cells on Alcatraz. Did you ever see the kids who lived on the island? No. What jobs did you have while on, while on Alcatraz? I worked in the mess hall, the laundry, and the glove shop. Did you ever see contraband come through the laundry? No, they searched all the laundry, but if you wanted something, you could get it. In your book, you mentioned the fact that you were a good student. School was always easy for you. What do you think made you cross the line and begin stealing? The excitement. I got carried away. I met someone who was doing it and the life just sounded exciting to me. It becomes easier the more you do it. Why do you think you ended up on Alcatraz? I made the wrong choices. We are all born with the ability to make our own choices. But once you make the wrong choice, other people make your decisions for you. Are there any Alcatraz movies that are accurate? If there was a completely true movie about prison, no one would go to it because it would be so boring. It's the boredom that gets you. You were one of the few men who were released directly from Alcatraz. How did it feel to leave? The colors and immense distances seemed astounding. I had just come from a place that had no color and the farthest you could walk in one direction was less than 100 yards. The whole experience was really overwhelming. I felt better on the plane because it was a confined space. What would you tell a kid growing up today? Go to school, learn to read. The illiteracy rate of cons is so high, make the right choices. I've heard you say that since your years on Alcatraz, you've never been in any trouble, though you write you had a hair trigger temper. You wrote a powerful poem about this, which is on the back cover of your book. A lament. That dark man still lives deep inside me waiting, but his armor is resting, and he will soon deteriorate into dust, and so will I. Robert Luke. How did you manage your temper after Alcatraz? It took time. I learned to walk away from an argument before trouble started. I had a few problems with it, but gradually I gained control. After Alcatraz, did you dream about being in jail? Yes. For 51 years, I dreamt about prison. The prison dreams only stopped when I went back to Alcatraz and began speaking to the public about my experience. Before that, only my family and my best friend knew. In your book, you talk about the epiphany you had while on, Al on Alcatraz. You say that you realized the truth that no one was responsible for my actions but me. If you could offer words of wisdom to your 14-year-old self, what would they be? Your choices will get you in trouble if you make the wrong ones. If you make a wrong choice, pull your foot back. And that is the end of the interviews. These are just the notes and the um, credit she gives to people in helping her create this book. So that was kind of interesting, those different interviews of people who actually lived on Alcatraz.